Jesus, we give him praise and thanks for all of his prophets and the scriptures which they brought. We thank him for Moses and the Israelite prophets that gave us the Torah or the Old Testament. We thank him for Jesus who gave us the Injil or the Gospel and the apostles that gave us what is called the New Testament. We thank him for Muhammad ibn Abdullah through whom the last revelation to humanity before the judgment of this present world uh, that book is called the Holy Quran. I am a student of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and I could never thank Allah enough for his merciful intervention in our affairs in the person of Master Fard Muhammad the great Mahdi who is in the world and is championing the liberation struggle of our people particularly in the United States of America I greet all of you my dear and wonderful brothers and sisters with the greeting words of peace we say it in the Arabic language Assalamu Alaikum. First, uh, I want to say to all of you, I am honored beyond words to be here standing on this rostrum in front of this hallowed building in front of I don't know how many I'm not going to guess but I thank Almighty God Allah for every single one of you that decided to answer the call to demand justice or else. I watched the program in my hotel room and I want to say how happy I am to be a part of such a great showing of unity of the aboriginal people of our planet. I want our Native American family and brother Night Night Winter Night Wolf my brother I'm sorry that they cut you a little short but I want you to know how favored you are as a Native American giant standing for his people the native people who came in their native dress this is not like going to a football game with the redskins they are not here as some mascot they are here because they are the original owners of this part of the earth and we honor them with the honor that they are justly due. Yes, they are suffering in their land is very great. So all of those who cry for justice, no cry is greater than those who have suffered the most. And those who have suffered the most are the indigenous people, not only of America, but of the Western Hemisphere.
here and those of us who were brought into America not as pilgrims not as Puritans not seeking a, another way of worship but in the holes of, of ships to be made the burden bearers of the real citizens of America. It's hypocritical for us to say that we are citizens and we are still trying to get civil rights while at the same time we are denied the human right of self-determination. I'm honored to be here in front of this great, great house that was built by black slaves. So I don't think I'm encroaching on any American by standing on the ground that was paid for with the sweat and the blood of our ancestors. I'm honored to be here and am grateful to Congressman Danny Davis for having shepherded through both houses a joint resolution that allows us to be on the Capitol steps. I was so touched by our native brothers and sisters and our Hispanic brothers and sisters and some who are black may say, Farrakhan, why are you talking to all of these different ethnicities? We have to accept our position. I loved my sister and those standing with her who champion the call that black lives matter. I felt so happy to see her and to hear her and to know and for her to know that she <coughs> and black lives matter I welcome, have a cherished spot because they represent the future leadership. These are not just young people who happen to wake up one morning. Ferguson ignited it all. So all the brothers and sisters from Ferguson, all the brothers and sisters that laid in the streets, all the brothers and sisters that challenged the tanks. We are honored that you have come to represent our struggle and our demand. Again, I'm grateful for the choir that sung and the brothers and sister that sang. For Brother Rasul Muhammad and his wonderful song that he wrote about the great liberator Emiliano Zapata. And to all of you who made this day so far what it is every member of the clergy that prayed this morning the Muslim, the Christians 
the various prayers that were said, the native people who have their native uh, places, their teepees and what not on the grounds, they're sacred people. Yes, sir. And they deserve justice. And we, in unity, will not only get justice for ourselves, but justice for all those who are deprived of that precious essential of life itself. On this beautiful mall, which was a slave center, hundreds of years ago, right here. Down this mall, there used to be slave pens. And in that uh, movie, 12 Years a Slave, the black brother was brought here. Down on the, my left side, your right side, in a little yellow house where he was severely beaten before he was sent off to be a slave unjustly for 12 years. I feel the cry of our ancestors, the pain of those on whose shoulders we stand. I feel that the ancestors are happy that a young generation has arisen. I saw the faces of the young in line trying to come in and they made it, I guess safe, but they made it difficult but the young stood in their place until they could get in because that's who we work for. We who are getting older, and I'm speaking now of myself and, and my generation, what good are we if we don't prepare young people to carry the torch of liberation to the next step. What good are we if we think we can last forever and not prepare others to walk in our footsteps? So to the young that are here, we honor you. We know who you are. And we will not forsake our duty to you. There are some elders that are not worthy to pass on the legacy of their cowardice to our young people. Our young people will not listen to those made in America made by America and want to bow down in America to that which has given them hell. These young people are looking for fearless leadership. But leadership that cannot be bought. Leadership that is willing to sacrifice its life to see a better future for our children. I'm honored that my brother and friend, Father Flager, is here, who is a great fighter in Chicago. I'm honored that Cora Masters Barry is here. And I thank Allah for her and her dear departed husband, 
who really showed us the way. I thank Allah for all of you who want to sacrifice in some way to make a difference. There can be no freedom, no justice, no equity without the willingness of some yes, to sacrifice for the rest. Yes, what good is life Go ahead. Come on. if we're not free? What good is it to be alive and every day that you live, you see your people suffering? What good is it to be continue in life under tyranny? So there must come a time when we say enough is enough. It must change. And I am willing to do whatever it takes to bring about that change. I thank Allah for Brother Makandal from Haiti and Brother Vladimir from the Dominican Republic. Two great brothers that Islam has brought together but the machinations of white supremacy is trying to keep apart. Haiti and the Dominican Republic used to be called Hispaniola. And it's the first place that the wicked one, Columbus, set his feet. Tomorrow they say it's his birthday. I think it's tomorrow or the day after, Monday. Monday. But no indigenous people want to celebrate a man who came and dislodged them. A man who came seeking a new route to India and ended up in America and when they saw the original people that they saw, well, they must be Indians. Because we white folk don't make mistakes like that. But they're not just Indians, nor are we African Americans. We were here before a continent named Africa was named. We were certainly here before America's Vespucius and this part of the world was named after him. So we don't diminish ourselves by naming ourselves after Johnny Come Lately's. We are the aboriginal people of our planet and before there was a planet, we were here with God. In the beginning, black woman, you are not the second self of man alone. You are the second self of God. And as the second self of God, any man that would disrespect a female is an enemy of God because she is the greatest gift from God to a man. May I pause for a moment and say to women, your language must change as to how you address yourselves. You should never call another woman a bitch. Get that word out of our language. No female is after a dog. Every female is after God. 
So all of you black men that like to use such words, pull it out of your tongue before your tongue is pulled out of your head. Every woman is from the Creator. Her womb is the workshop of God. So when a man sees a woman, he should bow in honor to her. The Native Americans can teach us much in the respect of women. I've been up on the reservations, I've been in the Anipi, I've been to some of their ceremonies. And the native people, the men, draw blood, hanging from trees and carrying skulls of animals in dirt attached to the flesh of their back in tremendous pain until the flesh snaps and blood pours out. The native people do that to pay honor to the woman for she is in labor enduring the pain of death to bring forth new life. And there's always a show of blood before the birth. So the man is trying to equal himself up to the woman. That means that the native man who disrespects your female, you have lost your way. And any black man under the sound of our voice, any red man, any yellow man that will traffic in women and girls, you are worthy of death itself. Now, through the womb of a woman, every great one was born, and every no good one was born. <laughs> but my dear sisters who are here today, if you are expecting I would love for you to place your right hand over your womb and I want to ask Allah that every woman who is pregnant that she would bring her child to term And I pray that that child will be a warrior for a brand new world. And that brand new world will come out of the womb of women with strong men as their protectors. Now it is your body. You can do with it as you please. But it would be so tragic if the next sitting bull was aborted. It would be tragic if the next Malcolm X or Martin Luther King or the next Moses or Abraham or Jesus was flushed away. You don't know who your child is going to be. 
if you are wise, your child could be the answer to your prayers. Why do you pray, brothers and sisters? Go ahead. You pray that things would be made better. You whose fathers or mothers or cousins or aunts have died from cancer, don't you want to see a cure for such a disease? That cure is not coming out of the sky. That cure is coming from the womb of a female that may think she is not important. But out of that womb could come the cure of every disease that humankind is suffering from. There was a strange circumstance around my birth. And my mother did not wish to carry me to term. And in those days, they didn't have abortion clinics. Women who wanted to abort the new life used hangers, metal hangers. My mother tried three times to abort my life because the circumstances under which she was pregnant were uncomfortable for her and she didn't want to face what my being a child light skinned when the man she was with was dark skinned and, and so was she and she wouldn't be able to tell him that I was his so after the third time trying to abort my life she said let it be and she prayed and prayed for God to come into her life and give her peace and strengthen her for what she thought she would have to face. She didn't know that those circumstances and her prayers went into what was in her womb. She didn't know that her insecurity because of a circumstance made her feel secure in the prayers she was sending up to God. And so she gave birth to a child knew God from an early age she gave birth to a child that never in my life did I find refuge in any man my refuge and my protection was always grounded in my faith in a superior being. So many people wonder, why is Farrakhan so bold? It's because I am free from fear. How could Farrakhan tell the FBI and the CIA and the IRS to go to hell? when others tremble at their name yes. they don't have a name big enough to make a man who has been shown the arm of God to be afraid of a man who can never do to me 
nothing more than what God would have them to do. And if he permits it, I'm for it. Even if it's my death. Our problem is there's too much fear among us. And fear is what takes a man and makes him a punk. Women are showing more strength. As Sister Ava said earlier, she's the natural protector of what her womb produces. And sisters, you should never love any man more than the love you have for what your womb produces if that man becomes a violator of your child. Go ahead, say that. Knowing God not talking God, but knowing God is what takes fear from your heart. A fearful people can't be free. A fearful people will bow down when it appears that the enemy is so strong and we are so weak. As I was preparing this morning to come, I was thinking about us who are preachers who can quote the Psalms. The Lord is my strength and he is my salvation. Of whom then shall I fear? Of whom then shall I be made afraid? But then when the enemy comes and challenges his words, we find him weakening, running away, leaving the sheep to be eaten by the wolves. That's why Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. Yes. Any man in leadership yes. that is not willing to give his life for the flock that supports him and feeds him and clothes him right. is not worthy right. of being a leader. Many in leadership today are willing to take a little money. It grieves me to see how many of us will sell out the future of our people for a little money. that allows us to get an upgrade in our automobile or an upgrade in our suit or shoes. And I ask myself the question, when will corruptible put on incorruptible? Because all corruption is an enemy of the progress of man. All corruption, all deviation from honesty and integrity. You say, well, Farrakhan, I mean, my God, what are you saying? I'm saying that if you love God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loved your brother as yourself, 
nobody could give you enough money to make you betray yourself as well as your brother or sister. When I first started rebuilding the nation of Islam, In Chicago, a man came to me and said, Farrakhan, everybody got a price. I wondered who he had met. That everybody that he knew had a price. I said, well, this man don't have a friend. Nowhere. Because a friend will never betray his friend. How many in this audience have been called by the government authorities and told to lie? Because they wanted a certain person and if you lied they would make it easier for you in your sentence. How many of us have sold out to get a lighter sentence and made your brother who was innocent a victim of the justice system that is unjust by telling lies? I'm talking to you like this. I didn't have, I have some notes that I put down, but I haven't opened it. Because this is not a day, 10, 10, 15. Hell no. If this is a day and we come out and go back to doing what we were doing before we got here, then this is all vanity. Yes, sir. This is vanity. Yes, sir. But vanity is the work of someone who's wrapped up in himself. Yes, sir. We have no time for vain expression. Those whom the world honors are those who live for others. And in their death, they are never dead. There's always someone coming up to refer to their greatness because They lived for others, and their living was not in vain. Well, why am I saying that at this point? We're facing another election. Yes. The Republicans have, I don't know how many. Is it 17? Well, it was, I eh? And they are really like the pretty girl who is well formed, showing her wares so that some man with money will buy her. Who wants to be a whore? No, 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 listen to me. Do you think people with money put their money behind you if they don't expect something from you? That's what makes this a farce. $3.3 billion in the last few years has been paid by lobbyists to this house. Well, what are they lobbying for? Laws? that may not be in the best interests of the people? How then can you look in the mirror at yourself when you are bought and paid for whore? Right. 
And then what do you get for being a whore? John Fitzgerald Kennedy lies across the water in a beautiful grave with an eternal flame. And John Fitzgerald Kennedy had a beautiful home. He had boats. He, he had so much material wealth. But the end is the same. A spot in a little coffin and six feet of dirt. So the Bible says it right. Naked came I in the world and naked go I out. So what are you lying and cheating and stealing for to give something to your children who if you lied and cheated and stole to get what you got, you couldn't teach them value. So all that you left is squandered by ignorant children. Don't you think it would be better to be like Dr. King? No, I'm very serious now. He didn't have a lot of money. He could have if he were a sellout. Malcolm didn't have a lot of money. He could have. Great ones don't amass wealth to leave to children. Great ones amass wealth to leave to institutions that live after they are dead and gone. The grave is waiting for every one of us that are gathered here today. But well, why are you saying this, Farrakhan? Because this is not a moment, as my sister said. This is a movement. I'm going to say it again. This is not a moment. This is a movement. When the brothers and sisters arose in Ferguson, yes. you didn't have any money. You had a principle. A principle that you were willing to suffer for, that you felt was bigger than yourself and your life. the withstanding of pain. But all of a sudden, the enemy comes with money. If we give you this, will you come out of the street? And some of us, we're all poor, but some of us see that as an opportunity. So the move begins to die the moment those who lead the movement take money as a bribe to stop hurting a force that you're coming against. The demand for justice 
demands integrity. The demand for justice demands selflessness. The demand for justice is bigger than all our lives. So the demand for justice must give us the will to wish to sacrifice our life because the many are greater than the one. And so, we're here today. I have some hard truths to say. And I want you to bear with me. Because I want to show you why there's no government on this earth, not one, that can give the people what the people desire of freedom, of justice, and equity. Look around you, brothers and sisters. Look at, look at the trees. Look at the flowers. Look at the bushes. All of it starts with a seed. A simple seed. Seeds come in colors, different colors and shapes and sizes. But a seed hides what God has put within it. Until and unless the seed is placed in the proper environment. So all these lovely living things that are around us, Go ahead. all of them start from a seed and that seed is planted in the earth. It is nurtured by water and that magnificent sun. And then the seed swells and bursts, sending a root down. And then a shoot comes up. And then what was within manifests itself. And it is then a glory of God, its creator. You all started, we all started from a sperm, a seed. God is not wasteful. A hundred million sperms may be released at one time. Some even say a billion, but only one can fertilize that egg. Well, God, if you're not wasteful, what happens to the other sperm? What do we do with it? <laughs> that sperm becomes food for the new life. We have a farm, and every time we're sowing seeds to raise a crop of beans or corn or whatever vegetation we desire, the birds sense seeds are being sown. So you see the birds collect over the land. If the seed doesn't go deep enough, the bird flies down and the seed becomes food. God wastes nothing. But you are a seed. I am a seed. We have not yet been placed in the proper spiritual or physical environment that would cause the seed to swell and burst 
and let what is within come out that we could say, I am a part of the glory of God. So Elijah Muhammad wanted the Muslim program to be brought before this house. I don't know anybody in the house that I could trust to bring his program. So I came to bring it myself as his student. <clears throat> now I want you to think about what I'm about to say. This program has been appearing on the back page of Muhammad Speaks and the final call since 1961, the Muslim program. You say, well, I don't want to hear that. I, I ain't no Muslim. Okay. What are you? What are you? If I ask you to tell me your nationality, you'll point to some little spot on the earth that you think defines who you are. That's limited. I'm from Georgia, good for you. I'm from Mississippi, I'm from Alabama, but I'm from New York. Right, right. But that does not define who you are. I'm from Jamaica, man. I'm from the Caribbean. Oh, I'm from Africa, I'm from Ghana, Guinea, Mali. That don't define you. You are defined by the nature in which you are created. And if your nature is the same as the nature of God, no land mass can define you. So the Quran says, Set your face for religion, being upright, the nature made by Allah, in which he has created man. And there is no altering Allah's creation. A dog is a dog. Not because you call him a Spitz or a Terrier or a Great Dane. That's, those are names of different species of dogs. But the dog is defined by the nature of its creation. Yeah. I don't care whether it's a Spitz or Terrier or what do you call it, a, a shepherd or pit bull? If it's a male, whenever it sees a, a hydrant, it will lift its leg. Did nobody teach it how to do that? That's what dogs do. <laughs> if you understand your nature, then you will understand the unlimited possibilities of the human being. God created no human being without depositing in that human being a gift that can be expressed to an excellent degree. That's the nature of God. That's not an un excellent tree it's excellent it's not an un unexcellent bird it's, it's a bird it's a worm it's a flea it's an ant it's the sun it's the moon it's the stars this is all an excellent creation from an excellent creator and you are an excellent creation from an excellent creator 
but you have to know yourself relationship to God in order to extract what is within and bring it out to the glory of God. Now a lot of black people that work in this house listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Yes, sir. A lot of black people who have mastered their particular sport or their particular discipline and they feel excellent. You know, they walk with a certain heaviness and a certain pride and when they come in the, ring, uh, in the room, they, some of them just suck up the atmosphere. Oh, look, there's so-and-so. There's so-and-so. As though so-and-so is greater than you so-and-so they're only great in your eyes because you have not focused your eyes on the greatness of yourself so look brothers and sisters the greatness of God is part of the thing that makes us so dissatisfied with government. You're yearning for something that the government can't give you. You are born to be free. The Muslim program says we want freedom we want a full and complete freedom that's not just what Muslim want that's what every human being wants but how will you define a full freedom and a complete freedom if I'm a seed and I'm 50 years old and I'm still a seed. Wow. Have never been planted in the right environment to develop myself. Then I don't have freedom. But when I'm free and fully developed, then I have attained a full and complete freedom. Yes, sir. Can this house give you that? No, Come on. No, sir. No, sir. Well, you don't have it. So what are we petitioning this for? They can't give you what's not in their nature to give you. We just making a demand because it's right to do it, but we know they, they can't do it. Oh, well, wait a minute, Farrakhan. Why can't they? Let me show you why. The other day, for the first time, I said, let me go out and visit all the monuments that are on this mall where we as a people will be standing. And I quietly, as quiet as I could, slipped into the Jefferson Memorial. And I stood there looking at a 19-foot statue of a great American. Now this mall is hallowed ground for us. But it's also sacred ground for those who love America. <clears throat> and Thomas Jefferson was one of the most brilliant of the founding fathers of this country. If you read his words, I'm going to read a few just to let you see that he was not a Christian 
He never said he was, but he certainly was what they call a deist. He believed in one God. Now look at this. He said, on the wall, he was talking about justice. And he was talking about slavery. I want to give you a little study assignment. There were some things when he wrote the Declaration of Independence that they took out because he was dealing with King George as a vile man because he trafficked in black bodies, bringing them to America. I want you to go read his words because Thomas Jefferson knew that if the slaves were not set free one day what King George did by bringing us into slavery would cause the slave to rise and fight against those who were holding us in slavery. We have really come to that point now. Did you hear me? See, this thing has reached the point of explosion. Black people that are here, even those in high places, are saying, we can't take this much longer. There's uh, like a volcanic eruption that's coming now. You know they say volcanoes are birthed out of mag magnum. That is molten rock with gases and this molten rock and the gases at the bottom then you have an upper crust that begins to come down and meet the molten rock beneath. I said, isn't that an interesting picture? Because I hear you that are in the middle class crying out. Ain't too many middle class people here, but even if you were, you crying. Because the middle class is becoming the new poor. So that's the upper crust coming down to meet the magna below. It's bubbling now. And gases are coming up. And you see dust coming up from the sleeping volcano that has been asleep so long you play around it like it don't have power to kill you. Yes. You play with the lives of poor people, indigenous people, black people, women. You play with the lives of soldiers who have given their lives on a foreign battlefield only to come home and be rejected and die while they're waiting for treatment and service. Why are you saying this in front of the capital, Brother Farrakhan? I want to show the world hypocritical America that is telling everybody that they're violating human rights. While in America, there's all this dissatisfaction. Yes, sir. Please. Yes, sir. Please. Yeah. I think, Mr. President, we ought to be quiet, telling China 
you got to straighten out your human rights uh, violations going down to Cuba. Yeah, well, we're going to have relations with you, but your human rights violations. See, as though you don't have no problem in America. We're trying to show the world these are problems here. And these problems demand resolution. And America don't have the heart to do it. Thomas Jefferson gave some brilliant remarks about freedom and trembling for America when he reflected that God is just and that his justice would not sleep forever. And then Thomas Jefferson with others fashion the seal of this nation and at first the seal reflected the wrath of God in a light from above and Pharaoh army below that the wrath of God he was saying in the seal would come down on America if America would not free the slaves. He knew it should be done. So Thomas Jefferson said, we need to let the slave go. We need to give them a good send off. We need to give them land. We need to give them machinery. We need to give them seeds to plant crops. We need to teach them the science of warfare that they would be able to defend the land that they would be given. This is Thomas Jefferson. But he couldn't force it. There are good white people who want to see you free, but the politics of the situation will not allow it to happen. I don't care nothing about what the politicians are saying. Yeah, we, 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 we think uh, you all should, you know, have some freedom. And like the Pope who came so beautifully a few weeks ago, and I listened to him. I took a few days rest from the tour because I became sick with pneumonia. <clears throat> and I went away for 10 days. And during that 10 days, His Holiness was here. And I watched him every day until his plane left. And yes. I thought about this, this human being who yes. has captured the world. Yes. And then I thought about him in Ecuador and in uh, Bolivia. I think it was Bolivia. Three countries in South America. And the Pope asked them to forgive the church. Did you hear that, um, brothers and sisters? Now, he didn't say forgive Jesus. Because the church that was killing the indigenous people really wasn't connected to Jesus. They were connected to a cross that was given to Constantine in a vision. And in Latin, under that cross, it said, in hoc signo win case, with this sign we conquer. So the cross and 
Christianity at that time was not the real teaching of Jesus Christ. It was a philosophy, an ideology based on white supremacy. Will you forgive us? And the Pope asked, I, I didn't hear the answer that the people of Ecuador and Paraguay and I think it was Bolivia. Uh, we don't have the answer. But in, in Charleston, after nine of our brothers and sisters were killed, before the dead were even buried, before the culprit even asked to be forgiven, we, with our loving misunderstanding of Jesus Christ, said what? What did we say? We forgive you. You don't even allow yourself to grieve naturally. You say, well, Jesus, don't put your cowardice on Jesus. Sure, he said, love your enemies. He wasn't talking about loving Satan. Oh, wait now. Come on. Show me in scriptures where Jesus said, we all ought to love Satan. The devil. See, the devil was wicked from the beginning. He wasn't somebody that committed a sin and did a wrong that you might forgive. But look at you black people. You so evil. You won't forgive your mother. Some of you don't even talk to your father. Some of you don't talk to nobody that dis does you wrong but you'll come with the children of the enemy on your arm. Find me a Jew that forgives Hitler. And you say they're the people of God. And they don't have no forgiveness in them. You really need to get acquainted with Jesus. <laughs> the Pope is not a foolish man. But he made a saint out of somebody that the native people don't see any sainthood in. That's like us taking the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan and beatifying him and making him a saint. But what about all the people that you kill? What about all the evil that you have done? Should we forgive? Well, the Holy Quran says it like this. You may forgive, but I, God talking, will never forgive. Right. See, now the God that I'm about to talk to you about now is on scene today. Thomas Jefferson couldn't deliver. 
I went to the Lincoln statue. And while I was in there, they had Dr. King speaking. I said, what is Dr. King doing? Speaking in the Lincoln Memorial. So I listened. And then I reflected on Abraham Lincoln's words. It's written there for the people to see. He said, and I, I hope I'm quoting it right. He said, if I could preserve the union and keep all in slavery, I would do it. Did you hear me? And he said, if I could preserve the union by letting half the slaves go free and keeping the others enslaved, I would do that. His aim was the preservation of the union, not freeing you. And that's why you're still singing. We shall overcome. You've been tricked. You've been had. You've been took. You've been bamboozled. In the words of Brother Malcolm, we have been deceived. Abraham Lincoln, though, in his Lincoln Douglas debates he said you suffer talking about black people from being in America with us and we suffer from your presence have you heard that before well go look it up That's one thing you won't say about Farrakhan. You, you say he's a hate teacher, he's this, but you won't call me a liar. <laughs> Look at this. He said, as long as the two of us live together, there will always be a superior and an inferior. And I, as much as any white man, want the superior position assigned to the white race. That's your aid. But he knew you was a problem. And he said, let me see if I can get rid of it. So he called some Negroes to the White House. See now, you know, when you call a Negro, not a black man, but you call a Negro who's bending and scratching. And with his head bent low, talking to the boss man. He said, will you Negroes accept to be separated? I will give you land in Africa. We will back you up. We will give you what you need, you know. But you'll be on your own. I will, but, 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 but we'll help you. And the Negroes said, not us. We didn't lose nothing in Africa. No. So he backed off because the Negroes didn't want it. And he probably couldn't sell it to white folks who might have still wanted our presence as what we are. You know, people play with us. You are a wonderful prey in the hand of a mighty people. But you're just a prey. 
And that's not spelled P-R-A-Y. Uh, that's spelled P-R-E-Y. Now watch this. Now we are 150 years up from Abe. But the worst thing about today is we have fulfilled our prophesied time to be in bondage. Now you black people that are here, you teachers, I want you to look this up. They say the first slaves landed in America in 1619. But if you really study in the Congressional Library right here in Washington, first slaves were brought on a ship named Jesus of Lubeck under the captaincy of Sir John Hawkins. Yes, sir. Not in 1619, but in 1555. Right. If you subtract 1555 from 1619, you get 64 years. When I was a little fella, they had a quiz show that was called the $64 question. Then it's, no, I know what I'm talking about, son. You a Johnny come lately. I said it right. It first started as a $64 question. Then it went to $64,000. That's when you came in. <laughs> How you gonna talk to the old man? <laughs> now, 64 years of hidden history is what turned you and me from an African black person into a Negro having eyes but can't see, ears can't hear, tongue can't speak, spiritually blind, deaf, and dumb. And when, once that happened, our mother's gone, our father's gone. You couldn't hear your father, your mother pray, and you couldn't hear your father, so you woke up with white folks' names on you. Now, white people are very smart. They stamp you with themselves just so they can recognize you. You know, when you're stealing something in, in the mall, I don't know whether you do anything like that, but when you're stealing something in the mall and you get to a certain point, the buzzer rings. See, you can't get out the store until what is in your possession that caused the alarm to go off is checked. See, white folk been knowing that you are their property. That's why they name you. So when you go for your passport and uh, what is your name? My name is Larry Wilson. Hmm. Sadie McDonough. Hmm. Hmm. Lewis Green. Hmm. They say, yeah, this, this is one of them. Because you're named after your former slave master. You can't be free walking around in the name of your former owner. 
Your first act of freedom is to tell him thank you, but no thank you. Take your name back. And look, take a name. That is an African name. That is a name of your people or a Islamic name, which is since you're from God, why shouldn't you be named after God who is your creator? You say, well, oh, well, if I take, just take a name like that, I'll go to them and they'll say, well, you, you have to go to court. I say, you didn't go to no court to name me. Right. And I'm not going to no court to give you back your name. See, you got to stand up today like a free man. Don't let them tell you what you got to do. Show them your independence and your knowledge. I'm a free man. That's not my name. That's your name. Take it back. I'm giving it to you. Didn't you hear my brother say the Dominican Republic was enslaved by the Spaniards? See my Mexican family here? What is your name? My name is Gonzalez. My name is Ramirez. And I speak Spanish. And you look at your Haitian brother, he's Francois Chancy. You say, but damn, where did he get that name? He's speaking French. Pour les français? Comment allez-vous aujourd'hui? Oh! Oh, he's different. He's French. No, he's a conquered black man with a white man's language and a white man's name and believe it or not with the white man's religion now let me tell you something about Jesus and the white man's religion see if you really had the religion of Jesus we wouldn't even be here talking today you be free right now if you really had the religion of Jesus. But you and I were baptized into that which made us think Jesus was Caucasian. Well, there's a few things I want to say before I close. Look, they don't want me to stop. <laughs> They're hungry. And that's why Jesus said, and I'm saying this to pastors. That's why Jesus said to those of us who are shepherds, lovest thou me, Peter? Feed my sheep. He wasn't telling you to feed them some government cheese. <laughs> He's telling you to feed them the real gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why they don't want me to stop. Because they're being fed. Now look, I don't want to miss my point. We were prophesied to be in America 400 years. Let's deal with that. Go home, get your Bible. Open to the book of Genesis. The 15th chapter. The 14th 15th and 16th verses. It reads like this. Know of a surety, Abraham, your seed is going to be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. 
and they shall serve them and they shall be afflicted 400 years. Who you think that's talking about? It's you. You're the only people that have been under a strange man in a strange land for 400 years. Look at what the scripture says. But after that time, God talking, I will come. And I will judge that nation that they shall serve. Yes, sir. We are now living in the day of judgment. And I'm sorry, I don't like to hurt your feelings, white or black brown or red or yellow but America now has entered the time of divine judgment I want you to listen to me because when I finish today you're going to see and hear things that you've never seen or heard before and I'm going to tell you what's coming by the guidance of God and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I'm going to judge that nation. Now the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said America is in the crosshairs, these are not his words, they're mine, of the judgment of God. He's after America. Right. Oh, Farrakhan, well, if you don't love America, leave it. You can't tell me to leave. I can tell you to go. Well, let me just be more clear. We pay the price to own this with our indigenous brothers and sisters. We pay the price. I know you're an immigrant, bless your heart. When you got here, the streets were paved with gold for you. From the sweat and blood of slaves that worked for 310 years for no pay. Go ahead, say that. And another 150 years as a free slave, yes, never getting what we are worth. America is under divine judgment. Now look at this scripture in the book of Revelations. The nations are angry. Look around the world. All the nations are upset. All of them. Then the scripture said, and thy wrath is come. Nobody cares that the nations are angry. You got to worry about the wrath of God that has come. You want to know about what is all else? See, you all, with your tender hearts, you never understood what justice is. Justice for Pharaoh is not the same as justice for the children of Israel. Right. Oh, hey. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. 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 Go ahead.
justice for the oppressed is not the same as justice for the oppressor. Mercy is for the oppressed. So Jesus said, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth the same, shall he also reap. Oh my God. That's a horror story for somebody. Say, behold, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet. See? What is he going to do? He's going to turn the hearts of the children, you, back to your father. And your father's heart back to you, lest the earth will be smitten with a curse. This is a sad day. It's a great day, but it's a dreadful day. <clears throat> it's great for the righteous. It's dreadful for the wicked. Thomas Jefferson knew it was coming, tried to beat it. Abraham Lincoln knew it was coming, tried to beat it. I went by Dr. King's monument. I've learned to love my brother. Because if you would go and study the speeches that Dr. King made in the last two years of his life, you will know that Dr. King was not a dreamer. Dr. King had awakened from that dream and said, I quote, that, that my dream had turned to a nightmare. These are the words of Dr. King. And the night before, he was assassinated. I want you to see what Dr. King was saying a few days before. Go ahead. Oh, my brother, Dr. King. He started talking about I want to quote him right because I don't, this is too important. <laughs> My son said what Dr. King said. I, I want to get the language right tonight. And that man. And when you read how Dr. King evolved, we will evolve with him. He was not a dreamer. He was a great revolutionary thinker like his brother, Brother Malcolm. And while I'm on the subject of Brother Malcolm, now there's a group of people out here that think that Farrakhan has something to do with the murder of Brother Malcolm. Okay, let's deal with it. I want to ask you a question. Do you know any murderer that white folk don't like? That they could pin a crime on? And he's still standing here speaking with his foot deep up in their backside? <laughs> From this sacred place, we ask that the FBI reveal, open up, 
on Brother Malcolm X. Go ahead. Don't redact a damn thing and let the people see what really happened to Brother Malcolm. Go ahead. See, they're killing me with you through media and some who claim to know Malcolm and love Malcolm. And if I could get close to you, I would show you that you don't love him as much as you say. Right. 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 Yeah, well, you all killed him. Well, some Muslims were involved. Who was the man giving him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation when he got shot? It wasn't one of the followers of Elijah Muhammad. It was an agent from the police department undercover. The white man wanted Malcolm dead. And naturally, we were angry with brother because he spoke against his teacher and his teacher's personal life. Now, hey, 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 reverend. <laughs> Black leader, you, you, you all, let, let's talk a little bit. See, I don't want these holy Negroes to talk about how bad Elijah Muhammad was. He had wives. What do you have? See, you playing women. Ishmael, where is he? Front and center, move here. Rasul, Move here. Abdullah Yassin. Move here. Kamal Muhammad. Move here. That's right. Yeah, I want you to see the sons. And Ahmed Mohammed, where's Ahmed? Seen Kamal. I'm still looking for Ishmael. Oh, you must be somewhere counting money. <laughs> no, he's not. He's been very busy. But these are Elijah Muhammad's sons. Where's Marie Muhammad? Medea Muhammad. See, I want to show you not an evil man, but a good man. Now, this is Marie Muhammad, one of Elijah Muhammad's daughters, and my former daughter-in-law, still my daughter-in-law. Her children are my grandchildren. That's right. This is Medea Muhammad. And her children are here. Right over here, son. This is Kamal Muhammad, a scientist. Each of these are spiritual giants. That's right. 
at him. You, look, look, this is Elijah's son. That's real. Look at him good. See, a man that want to have fun with a woman want to hide the, uh, the fact that she becomes pregnant. Where's Ahmed? <laughs> now these are with me. Yes, we are. All day. Every day. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And they are champions in their fields. And they're helping me build a nation. Yes, sir. You talk about passing the torch. You got to be careful that there's some light on the stick you got in your hand. That's right. That's right. Because if you pass in the same madness that you got, you're falling in the ditch, and the one you give the torch to is going in the ditch right after you. Hell no. You got to have wisdom to lead our people today out of the clutches of a deceitful, satanic mind. That's yes, right. That's right. We war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. These are the children from Elijah Muhammad's wives and the mother of Rasul and Ishmael and Medea and Ahmed is a spiritual scholar known all over the world. Mother Tainetta Muhammad. Where are the grandchildren? See, if it were not for Elijah Muhammad's marriages, I wouldn't have these illustrious helpers. Right. Because none of the first family helped me. In the rebuilding of their father's work. But these that he had from the wives who loved him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Are committed to this cause of the liberation of our people all over the world. Yes, sir. He planted these in Mexico. Yes, sir. Because he wanted the union yes. of the black and the brown. And I have done the same. That's yes, right. Sir. That's yes, right. Sir. Absolutely. Yes, you yes, have. Sir. Now, you players. Let me get in a little word to the players. Yes, <laughs> tough, tough. Yes, sir. Women are not to be played with. No, sir. No, sir. They are sacred. That's right. And because there are more women than there are men, their stock goes down. And the male stock goes up. So men walk around like peacocks. <laughs> How many reverends have girlfriends in the church? Hello. <laughs> and how many reverence? Oh, I ain't going there. See, may I say to my LGBTQ family, let me tell you something. See? Those of us who are students of Elijah Muhammad, we're people. We don't 
ask you what your sexual preference is? We love you. We're not your judges. We want to work together to free our people completely. So to my family, this is my family. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. You'll never find me or us condemning you for what has become of us in our sojourn. Because yes. all the holy ones who will point to a gay brother or sister yes. Yes, are fornicators, adulterers, freaks, and everything else. So who of us can throw a stone at the next one? None of us. And the greatest example of that is Jesus himself. He said he came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill what was written in the law. Yet, they brought him a woman found in adultery. I'm coming to the end. Good teaching. And they said to Jesus, we found her in adultery. I don't understand how you can find a woman in adultery and she came by herself. Mm. When y'all figure that one out, let me know. <laughs> but how Jesus, who was supposed to witness her stoning to death according to the law of Moses, yes. the people got their stone in their hand, they ready. And Jesus knelt down and wrote in the sand, the one of you that is without sin, you cast the first stone. And they held their stones and dropped them by their side because they weren't clean enough to stone a woman found in adultery. Jesus was clean enough to do that. And look at what he said. Woman, where are your accusers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he said, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Dr. Ben Carson, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. running for president, made a statement about Sharia law. It's a very harsh law. But the man that came to teach us as Mahdi or guide, Come on, he never told us to cut off the hand of a thief or chop off the head or kill someone who's a homosexual. See, Jesus is a savior. Yes, sir. Yes, he is. Jesus does not come to condemn us for our sins. He comes to save us in spite of our sins. Now, to my father's family, I'm really honored to have them as my helpers. We're honored to have you as his helper. And we are part of the family as well. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is our Imam, Imam Sultan Rahman, the great grandson of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And he's the Imam of the Nation of Islam.
Now, as I close today, I don't want you to move yet, because this is instruction time. Yes, sir. America is under divine judgment as we speak. Elijah Muhammad taught us 50, 60 years ago of what we were going to face. And he said there would be four great judgments. Rain, unusual rain. Snow, unusual snow. Earthquakes. Hail. And that he would use the forces of nature against America. What you see going on in Charleston and in South Carolina is very serious. They have never seen rain like that at all. How? Why? That's divine judgment. When I leave you today, the calamities are going to get stronger because God wants America to let us go. Not integrate us. Let us go and give us a good send-off. Those of you who are scripturally sound, Moses was not an integrationist. And neither are we. Let me be clear. America has no future for you or for me. She can't make a future for herself, much less a future for us. The scripture says, come out of her, my people. And we're going to have to come out. But don't worry. God says he takes the kingdom from whom he pleases and he gives it to whom he pleases. America, you have a chance to stop the judgment or delay it. Did you hear what I just said? This judgment can be delayed, but it's a very narrow window of opportunity. I close with this before instruction. Brothers and sisters, they came to Jesus and they asked him, when is the end coming? He said, look at this, you can look in the sky and see by the redness of the sky. You can discern that it's going to be a good day. But you cannot read the signs. He said, this wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. But no sign shall be given to you except the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the great fish three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Now this scriptural scientist, I want you to study. Who is the Son of Man? He's a man from a man. Don't you be looking for no spook. The believers in spooks don't understand the law of cause and effect. And that's why your seeds that have not shown forth the glory of God, so your food for the bloodsuckers of the poor. 85% of the people in every nation are in poverty. 
and 10% of the people have knowledge, but they will not share it with the poor. So they live off the poor. In America, 85% of white people don't understand the law of cause and effect. But there are 10% among them that do understand. And they work for the rich. And they work against the poor. And the poor are poison animal eaters. They eat hog flesh. Sounding their mental powers and robbing them of their beauty appearance. They don't know the law of cause and effect. They believe that all that you see is happening from a mystery God. But there's 10% that know. And they're sucking the blood of the poor. In the black community, we got 85% that are in bad shape. But you got 10% who robbed the 85%. Bad lawyers that take our money but won't fight for us. Everything is a plea bargain. Bad lawyers that want a third of the money from those killed but won't fight for justice. Bad doctors, bad pharmacies, bad people that hustle their brothers and sisters. So when I ask for 10,000 fearless men God stopped me short. I said 10,000 fearless men. When we put it up on our Facebook page, white folks said, oh, he wants 10,000 to start killing white people. Do I sound crazy to you? I said the next day, I said, wow, why would they say that unless they think they deserve the justice of God? And then the next day, they cut my words and said, Farrakhan said, they deserve to die. I didn't say that. I said, that's what you must be thinking. When I say 10,000 fearless and all you can see is a bunch of black people out there killing white people. I didn't say that. A few days later I said we got to go into our community because our war is on two fronts. We got to stop the killing in the inner city and stop the killing of us from police wickedness. I need 10,000 fearless. I want 10,000 men that we can train because we got to stand between the guns. But you know what? When we go in our community to clean it up, guess who we're going to run into? We're going to run into rogue cops and wicked black people working together to suck the blood of the poor. Which means we got to be strong enough to stop the killing, but the moment we try to stop it, those who benefit from it will come against us. 
So we have to sit with the police and we're going to expose all your rogue policemen. Because you know where they are? They're in the black community. You know why they're there? Darren Wilson said, I don't want to do police work in the white community. I want to do police work in the black community because that's where the fun is. That's Darren Wilson. What's fun about your work in the black community, rogue police? See, you profit from the drug that's going on. You profit from the prostitution. You profit from the drug trade. You do. You kill us and blame it on another gang. That's the fun. But your days of having fun on our suffering is about to come to an end. I need 10,000 fearless black men. We got to clean up our community. And there's no way we can make a good people and leave them under the educational system of white supremacy. We have to take over the educational system. Because the education that you're receiving has not made you a good people or a better people. It made you a more willing tool or slave for your oppressor. That system has to go in order for black people to be set free. All educators, I'm calling on you. We got to take over. We got brilliant educators. We don't need to accept this poison doctrine of white supremacy any longer. We need a ministry of defense. We need a ministry of justice because we got to resolve our own conflicts without going downtown, spilling our affairs in the presence of those who make merchandise of us and laugh at us and make mockery of us. We got lawyers, we got judges. We can solve our own problem in the inner city with justice. And the last thing I will say is uh, other ministries, but the last thing I want to say is preachers, you are the most important. I was with Dr. Martin Luther King III and he said, Farrakhan, what can we do to turn this around? I said, Brother Martin, we have to take your father's philosophy of nonviolence and redirect it to black people. See, you've been working all this time to use your love to clear up the hate that's in the hearts of white people. 50 years after, it's still the same. Turn your attention to yourself. Come home and teach love for one another. Teach love of the neighbor. Teach us to forgive each other for our acts of evil done under the oppressor's mind that he put in us. I would like to have 10,000 fearless women. You know, I wish I could show you the women in the nation. These are warriors. These are scholars, but they know how to cook. They know how to sew. They know how to rear their children. 
and they know how to, uh oh, uh oh. Look at them, brothers and sisters. And sisters, if a sister came up and stood beside them with a mini skirt and a low cut dress that's beckoning nursing babies, yes. which one of these sisters would somebody say, hey baby? See, they don't talk like that to our women. And if they do, it's a terrible mistake. That's right. That's right. Now, when women are clothed, they earn respect. The beauty of your form is for your husband. And if you don't have a husband, keep it covered. Because the one that you get as a husband will be the dog that saw what he wanted and it wasn't you. It was the beauty of your form. Them beautiful hips. Those succulent lips. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Now my sisters all them they're very highly intelligent you can't come to them with weak conversation because they see right through you brother they know how to cook they're food scientists and let me tell you sisters you know you're beautiful but a woman who's beautiful and can't cook is a killer in the kitchen. And I don't think you would be wise marrying a killer and she kill you in the kitchen with a whole bunch of greasy food. These sisters know how to keep their self alive, their families alive, their children alive. Thank you, sisters. Oh, that was really nice. Where's the young men? Bring me the young soldiers. I hope you're not slow. Quick moving, fast thinking, cleanliness in and out, right down to the modern times. Well, are they all on post? Oh, okay. But we got some fine young men that we are training. I'm 82. I don't know how long I got, but I'm not worried because I got a torch lit with the wisdom of God that I'm giving to every young person who will listen because when I leave, I want to leave somebody that will give the enemy hell until justice flowed down like a river and righteousness like a mighty stream. Yes, now I'm going to close with Christmas. Now did you know that we spend almost half of the money that we take in in a year during Christmas? We have 1.1 to 1.3 trillion dollars and 400 billion of it is spent during the Christmas holidays. And listen, listen, listen. Dr. King wanted us to redistribute the pain. Now suppose we decided, okay, this Christmas we're kicking Santa to the curb. This Christmas, you're not going to lie to your children telling them that this Caucasian 
from the North Pole brought them this gift. You're going to tell them the truth. I brought you the gift, baby. Me and your daddy, we hustle, but not this Christmas. This Christmas, we're going to sit around the table and we're going to bring Christ back to a day that was supposed to honor him. So you put the bottle down, put the loud down, put the beer down, and get around your table with clean food and teach about Jesus and then show love, forgiveness, and reconcile your differences within the family. Yes. And this will be the best Christmas that we've had in a long time. And if you can put $400 billion and keep it in your pocket, then you've got a little money to invest. And what we want to do is buy up as much land. And we're asking the government for 100 million acres as a start. That's about the size of California. We can provide a healthy meal with milk on the table, whole wheat bread, if we pool our resources. Look at these figures. We got about 30 million people, really now near 40, eating a slice of bread per meal. 90 million slices of bread per day, 630 million slices of bread per week, 32 billion 760 million slices of bread per year. How much land must we have under wheat cultivation to give our people our daily bread? Then Elijah Muhammad said, well, move to milk. How much land must we have? How many cows must we have? How much grazing land must we have to give our people a glass of milk a day? 40 million black people having three slices of wheat would require 1,222,935 acres of land growing wheat. To provide an eight ounce glass of milk each day to 40 million people requires the, mil the production of 7 billion 305 million pounds of milk by 389,102 cows on 389,102 acres of grazing land, one cow per acre yielding 18,774 pounds of milk per year. And to provide 40 million people with a daily bowl of soup, bean soup, requires 3,261,161 acres of land under navy bean cultivation. And all of these figures with just milk, a pure milk, wheat, bread, and beans, he said we could live 140 years oh, yeah. yes, off of that simple food. Now, if you want to lengthen the days of your life, you got to eat better, and you won't eat better if you allow your enemy to feed you. We're going to have to feed ourselves by buying as much land as we can. So tonight, as I leave you, tomorrow morning, I'd like to see the scholars. 
at the JW Marriott, we got to talk about what we're going to do after today. I would like engineers of every kind, navigators, pilots, farmers. I want college presidents, especially the black colleges. You got to know that you are not a plantation to produce more dumb Negroes with degrees. You've got to make the colleges teach the things that will make young people builders instead of beggars. Meet me tomorrow at the J.W. Marriott, 10, 11 o'clock, and we want to talk about what's next. Until then, oh God, you have made me so happy today just to look into your beautiful faces. I want you, when you leave here, go home to your wives and your families and before you leave, I want you to greet the people around you. Right. Hug them and tell them, I love you. Embrace your native indigenous people and tell them, we love you. And our Mexican family, embrace them and tell them, you love them. And from this day forward, this day of a demand for justice will never end until justice is ours. So the day is the beginning of that movement that will never end. All local organizing committees, you got to stay focused and keep working. It's not over. It's just begun. Thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum.